There's three knockoff Red Bulls coursing through my veins, and I'm running on four hours of sleep. I try to meditate in the back of the taxi, but the road to the warehouse is as jittery as my psyche. It's been a long week. Hell, with all the planning involved, it's been a long year. I am beyond exhausted and in desperate need of a vacation. But I content myself with the fact that everything that could have gone wrong has already gone wrong. There are no more problems to solve. There's a problem. Batima says, the moment that I step out of the taxi, she's dyed her hair green overnight and rotated out her usual piercings. But she's still wearing her dark blue bomber jacket, the one that's far too big for her. Where's the band? I ask. Is Johnny making problems again? Johnny and the rest of the fellas are pre-gaming at the hotel. She says, paying more attention to the cigarette she's rolling than to me. They refuse to come to soundcheck until the power is on. The power is out? That's the problem. A saber of surgical steel dangles from her lower lip as she licks her cigarette shut. Lights were flickering in the morning and by the time Techies finished setting up the stage, the whole building was without power. Batima lights her cigarette in the most casual way possible as my heart sinks deep into my stomach. This entire show has been cursed. Getting a permit to even put on the concert required enough bribes to make even the most creative accountant blush. There's been two date changes, three venue changes, and now, on the day that I've worked so goddamn hard for, there's no power. We have to call someone, I say, once feeling returns to my face. If there's no power, there's no show. We're opening up ourselves to massive liabilities. We have to call someone. I already did. Batima says, puffing on her smoke. She points over her shoulder to a chubby-faced man, pacing back and forth through a hands-free phone call. The best electrician money can buy around here. There's another problem, though. Our expensive friend here needs access to the basement. The hatch to the basement is locked. Well, can't we just pry it open? Techies tried. No dice. One suggested dynamite, but that probably wouldn't cover our safety deposits. We need the keys. And the keys are? I sniff at the air. I assure myself I'm not having a stroke. Not here. Owner isn't picking up. Googled around, found his assistant's number. Apparently the boss man is overseas to the 23rd. No way to retrieve the keys until then. She takes another long puff. Luckily I managed to... Are you kidding me right now? I yell the moment I recognize the smell. Doors open in six hours and there's no power in the building. I need you sober right now. Oh, chill. It's just a bit of hash. Keeps me focused. She offers me her joint. I don't dignify that question with a response. Instead, I remind her that the music industry is an industry based on reputation, and she's not making a good name for herself at the moment. Oh, I'm sure you'll have plenty of nice things to say about me tomorrow. Aside from the saber, there's no malice in her smile. Anywho, she says, found the owner's brother, gave him a call. Turns out he has a spare set of keys and wasn't happy to make the trip, but hey, look over there. There he comes. A silver Audi 80 bounces up the road and stops a couple paces from us. Batima slips the joint into my hand and goes over to speak to its driver. Without getting out of the car, the driver passes the keys over to Batima. He handles them between his thumb and pointer finger, as if they were toxic. 
I don't understand a word of what they're saying to each other, but it seems like the man is pleading with Fatima. As desperate as his face seems, she simply shrugs and smiles and waves goodbye. What did he say? I ask, after she replaces the joint in my hand with the keychain. Bet he doesn't want the keys back. We can just leave them with his brother. Says that we shouldn't be having any concerts over there because the basement of the warehouse used to be connected to the... Even hearing the name is hard on the ears. I make no effort to pronounce it. The what? I ask. Used to be an old secret research facility that's apparently haunted and the source of horrible dark signs. Kid story. That guy is too old to believe in that nonsense, and so are we. There's no place I'd rather be than back in Sydney. For a moment, I disassociate and imagine what I'd be up to if I hadn't signed up to handle a rock show in the middle of nowhere. With the time difference, I'd be about to clock out. Maybe. I'd be planning on heading out for some drinks and to see some obscure indie band that didn't have an agent yet. Hate to burst your bubble. My local contact says, stubbing out a joint. But doors open in six hours and there's no power in the building. Maybe we should get a move on? With a wave, she summons the electrician and we head to the basement hatch. On the way we relieve the security guys of their flashlights. The one I get, it barely works. Dark red banners cover the broken windows of the warehouse and expensive multicolored lights hang from the rusted walkway. Even though it's a warm day outside, the innards of the warehouse carry a chill. The basement is significantly colder. The ladder is barely deep enough to reach the floor. We stand on packed earth and around us sits heaps of scrap metal and smashed up crates. From the small rays of light we have, the place looks completely abandoned. Musk and rot and dust, it fills the air as we walk. I am beyond uncomfortable but the chubby-cheeked electrician seems to be in great spirits. He and Batima chat as we walk through the decrepit innards of the basement. I don't understand the language that they speak, but the tone of the chat, it reminds me of every friendly plumber I've ever met. The electrician seems to be in good spirits, but with one word, Batima takes all the cheer from his voice. The moment Batima pronounces the discomforting sound, the electrician stops so fast that I end up bumping into him. He doesn't apologize or move an inch. Finally, with his flashlight pointed square at Batima's face, he repeats the name in a whisper. She nods and smiles and laughs a bit. But... No sounds come from the man. He just keeps on walking. Oof, looks like he believes in children's stories as well. Batima says as we walk through the dark basement. Ah, well, as long as he can fix the power, it doesn't matter. We need to make sure to lock the hatch when we're done here, I say, passing my flashlight over the heaps of lawsuits disguised as scrap metal. Someone could get seriously hurt here. The electrician's steps are much less sure after Batima utters those unspeakable words. But he keeps moving. From the open hall of broken machines, we walk down into a set of tight hallways. With nothing deafening our footsteps, the echo bounces around the halls as if there were dozens of us. The electrician grumbles something. All the cheeriness he once possessed has dissipated. 
he says we're close to a fuse box or whatever it's called in English. But Tima translates. Good, I say. My flashlight flickers between low power and death, but I don't make much of it. In the darkness of the warehouse, I find my mind drifting back to home. No matter how it all ends, I tell myself, I'll be on a plane back in two days' time. The electrician suddenly stops once more. I bump into him again. He says something, but I don't understand. I turn around to ask Batima for a translation, but she's nowhere to be found. I yell her name, but all that comes back is an echo. Batima's absence makes the flashlight in the man's hand tremble, but he keeps talking. He keeps saying that terrible name over and over again. Something skitters in the darkness. I call out for Batima again, but the electrician shushes me. He lowers his flashlight. Things continue to scutter around in the darkness. The longer I look into the black, however, the more I notice a faint blue light. Seemingly, the electrician notices it too. A pale blue light shifting in the darkness, like a levitating snake. It moves closer to us. Slowly and with shaking hands, the electrician lifts his flashlight. A rat the size of a cocker spaniel. The moment the flashlight illuminates it, the vermin rushes past us. It bumps into the electrician. He lets out a high-pitched yelp. The rat scurries down towards the hallways we came from, but the patter of its feet is replaced by its kin. From beyond the small island of light, flickers of blue rise in the darkness. The electrician is heavy set, but he isn't in the midst of a sleep-deprived caffeine crash. As we run through the hallways, he outpaces me, and I am left with only my own flickering flashlight. Out in the darkness, more pale blue tails emerge. As I sprint, I struggle not to step on any of the mangy beasts that run by my feet. I do not question what they are. I do not question where they came from. All I want is to be back on the surface, safe and sound. Past my mad panic, however, I smell something. I smell hash. From the corner of my eye, I see a concentration of blue light. At its center floats a burning ember. I see Batima. She stands with her hand-rolled cigarette, surrounded by the incomprehensible vermin. For a moment, my panic clears and I call out her name. Yet, before the second syllable of her name leaves my lips, another wave of unimaginable terror washes over me. One of the furry beasts rushes past my leg. A jolt of energy shoots through me. It feels like I've pressed my entire lower body against an electric fence. I fear for Batima's safety, but I fear for my own so much more. I scream and I run and eventually come crashing into a ladder in an island of light. By the time I pull myself to the top rung, I start to feel faint. My muscles spasm without rhyme or reason and my mouth refuses to form words. The techies in the warehouse surround me with looks of curiosity and fear. Someone calls for a medic, but the rest of their words I do not understand. 
I keep trying to mouth Batima's name to make someone aware that she is still trapped in that hellish place. But my lips, they turn completely numb. Soon enough, however, my attempts to summon a rescue party become moot. Batima, ill-fitting bomber jacket and all, joins the crowd gathered around me. I manage to regain control of my tongue. I beg her to warn everyone about the giant electric rats and to call the police and an ambulance in the military. When my panicked rambling dies down, the eyes of the crowd shift over to Batima for a translation. She speaks slowly and with a calmness that seems wholly inappropriate. With the final word of her translation, the crowd looks back to me and erupts in laughter. What did you tell them? I cry. I told them that there's rats in the basement and they don't have rats where you come from and they find it funny that you're scared of rats. She smiles at me, as if we both didn't just witness a nest of incomprehensible amalgamations in an old Soviet warehouse. That's not true. That's not what I said. There's... About five hours left until we open doors and the building has no power. Chill. One problem at a time. We don't need the techies freaking out as well. She takes one last pull from her stubby smoke, wets her fingers, pinches it out and then chucks it in a nearby trash can. The medic that is brought in also doesn't speak English. With Batima's translation, I answer questions about my name, the date and where we are. Then he checks my pulse and blood pressure. I do not understand a word the medic says, but his tone is far from optimistic. Apparently, you should go to a hospital. Batima says, after the diagnosis is delivered. At risk of a heart attack or something like that. I can't just leave, I say. There's a concert. Yeah, I heard. She says, locking the basement hatch. How about we get you some fresh air? You reckon you can climb up the stairs? Stairs? I ask. The roof is about as private as this place is gonna get. There's already a line of a couple of dozen early birds in front of the warehouse. No alcohol is allowed at the event but bottles are liberally moving through the queue to utter apathy from the hired security. Seeing the crowd slowly grow makes my chest ache worse than the climb up the stairs. The electrician isn't coming back, Batima says, shutting the door to the roof. Called the guy while you were checked out. Offered double rate, triple rate, no dice. Guy ain't coming back on the account of the whole... Thing. The name makes me clench my teeth. What are we going to do? I ask, once feeling returns to my jaw. Well, let's tackle this one problem at a time. She places one boot on the edge of the roof and looks out into the distance, like an Asian Captain Morgan. We can probably get the opening bat to play a set outside. The techies are basically done inside, as much as I gather. Shouldn't be too much of a hassle to throw together a stage and I'll make some calls. Maybe we can scrounge up some generators for the amps. Johnny isn't going to play a show on generators. Oh, I know that. Batima says, patting the belly of her jacket. One problem at a time, remember? Getting the opener out gives us a little leeway. To do what? Call an exterminator? Don't be heartless, she says. Those things down there are harmless. Plus, killing them doesn't solve our no electricity problem. Harmless? One of them electrocuted me. Probably because you scared it. They're harmless if they're calm and... Hash chills them out. Hash chills them out? She nods. Don't freak out, Batima says grabbing the zip of her jacket. 
she unzips it. I freak out. The giant rat creatures were discomforting enough in the darkness, but seeing one in broad daylight sends a sharp sting through my chest and makes my knees weak. The moment my eyes meet the beast, it furls its flat mouth to reveal a row of uneven, yellow teeth. When Batima places the creature on the floor, it backs up as far away from me as it can. I, too, stumble to the edge of the roof. You fed it hash? I'm not the one who got electrocuted, she says. The rat creature wags its tail back and forth, kind of like an angry metronome. Foam gathers at the edge of its lips. I feel strands of my hair being pulled towards the sky. Shh. Batima hisses at the creature, throwing a thumb-sized ball of wax at its paws. The strange animal grabs the waxy ball, raises to its hind legs and consumes its treat in two swift bites. See? It works. The giant rat skitters over to Batima and takes rest at her feet. Even in its docile state, looking at this freak of nature makes me uncomfortable in my own skin. I take a seat on the edge of the roof. Don't jump. She says, smiling. I think I know how to solve the power problem. How? I ask. Batima scoops up the rat creature and zips up her bomber jacket once more. Probably shouldn't tell you, she says after a moment of thought. Liabilities and all. Are you going to do something illegal? Batima does not respond. She just smiles and produces a rolled cigarette from her pocket and hands it to me. I refuse it, but she insists. Apparently, I look like I could use a bit of sedation. As Batima goes downstairs, she asks me if she has my approval for some additional spending. Again, I ask her if she's planning on doing anything illegal, and in response, she just smiles and repeats her question once more. I say, okay, it's not like I have a choice. The crowd below grows with each minute. And near the front of the queue, two young guys have a loud disagreement. Before a proper fight breaks out, security manages to get them apart. I try giving Johnny a call, twice. He doesn't pick up. The third attempt is not the charm. Johnny does pick up, but he refuses to even consider an outdoor show. He's a rock star, he says, and rock stars don't run on generators. When he hangs up on me, my migraine dies down somewhat, but the ache in my chest does not. The roof is about as comfortable as a mattress of sandpaper. But looking up at the blue sky above, it does give me some semblance of calm. The noise of a crowd gathering below is impossible to ignore. But what's only heard hurts the heart less than what is seen. I stare up at the sky and I try to propel myself through time until all my problems are resolved. I convince myself I just want everything to be done with. Yet, as the sky grows redder in the sunset, my chest feels tighter and tighter. By the time I manage to pull myself up, there's a makeshift stage. Ever so faintly, I can hear the opening band play. They're good. Lots of heart. They're good, but... They don't have an amp. The crowd is huge. 
with the queue long collapsed, the people flood past the entryway of the warehouse and into the trees beyond. They're loud, yet seem to be in good spirits. Security seems to have everything under control, but I fear what the sunset will bring. For a moment, I consider calling Batima to check on her progress, but my hands grow clammy the moment I fish out my phone. I consider calling an ambulance, but instead I lie back down on the concrete. The sunset above, it is beautiful, but it does not calm my heart. With the world around me descending into darkness, I grab the spliff that Batima left behind. I try to take a drag of some of her calmness and, for a while, it works. For a while, I look up at the stars and I feel a cosmic sense of tranquility. The crowd below sings a song in unison and, though I do not understand the words, I feel closer to them. For a while, the hash works. But one look into the warehouse sends me crashing into a nervous breakdown. The hall is in complete darkness. Only a trio of flashlights move through the abyss, like searchlights scanning for prisoners. The beams float around the warehouse. One of them passes by the hatch to the basement. It's unlocked. I think about those rats. At first, I think about the possibility of someone getting zapped or bitten by them and my bosses getting sued. At first, I think about those abnormal creatures as a potential legal problem. But quickly, I become concerned with their mere existence. I become concerned with how these amalgamations of nature came to be and what horrid mind is responsible for them. I become concerned with the and I grow faint. The shock I was delivered in the bowels of the warehouse shoots through me once more and drives out my consciousness. I awake to a rumbling beneath my palms For a moment, my imagination turns the gravel to fur. For a moment, I fear I am being carried away to the depths of the... by the monstrous electric rats. But then, I hear music. Johnny sounds far from sober, but he is in his element... The music is amped up so loud now, I can feel it in my bones. Down below, someone vomits in the glow of a street lamp. Through the windows of the warehouse, there's a fantastic show. Flashing lights, smoke machines and loud, loud amplifiers. The power is back and the crowd below, they seem to be having a blast. I still get dizzy when I climb to my feet, but the music, it frees me of all heartache. I go looking for Batima. She stands on one of the rusty walkways overlooking the concert, tapping her fingers on the bar to the rhythm. When I see her, Batima flashes me a big thumbs up. I try to find out how she got the power on, but the music is far too loud. It's a cold night, but the warehouse is so packed, it feels like we're suspended above a hot spring. Johnny goes in for an encore, but after the final official song of the show, Batima motions up towards the roof. The air outside is colder, but considerably fresher. I trust you have plenty of nice things to say about me tomorrow. 
I hear this industry is based on reputation. I assure her, she will get whatever reference letter she desires. I apologize for anything unpleasant I might have said to Batima over the past couple of months. Thank her, and I beg her for an explanation. How did she get the power on? Use the zap rats. She says, pointing towards the general direction of the basement hatch. How? Am I meant to tell you? What if I did something illegal? Aren't there, like, liabilities and stuff? Did you do something illegal? I ask, my chest growing numb again. She shrugs. Put a bunch of hash. You fed those things hash? Yeah. She says, taking out her phone. They're pretty friendly when they're chilled out. Wanna see? I don't hesitate asking to be shown the video. I do not, for a moment, consider whether I wish to see more of the incomprehensible. As I watch, my heart grows weary once more. At first, all I see is familiar blue lights floating in the darkness. The tails of those beasts the lights grow more numerous and start to flail. Whenever they touch, sparks light up the darkness. The creatures all gather together, their tails glowing brighter and wagging like horrid lit up metronomes. An array of red and green lights light up in the darkness and then the whole basement is bathed in flickering fluorescence. I see the rat creatures clearly. Their mangy fur, their horrid teeth, their giant eyes. I see them for only a second before I am forced to look away. Weird, huh? She asks as my knees grow weak from the horror. Guess the is real after all. She hands me another hand-rolled cigarette, and I do not refuse it. And so concludes another episode of the United People's Institute series. Next Thursday comes a tale of research projects, clones, and hammers, read by Spencer Dillahay. If you can't wait a full week for another episode, drop by patreon.com slash Langer for a full 20-story season and a bunch of other early and bonus content. Also, if you haven't heard the first season of the United People's Institute series, there's a big old jumbo video of it down in the pinned comment for binge consumption. Big thanks to Creepy Oz and Tati for lending their voices to the tale and Repulsive for providing the spooky tunes. If you made it this far into the video, tell me about the last concert you were at. Who knows? Maybe a bit of your music taste will worm itself into another tale on the channel. And finally, as usual, a huge thanks to the patrons for making the show possible. Big old thanks to Bob Condor, Dante Kincaid, Matt, Joyce, Mr. Creepypasta, Coos, Christopher Barunda, Dying Son, Charlie Cooper, Paul, Paul Evans, Quiet Pills, Shion, and Larry V. If you want to join these illustrious scientific minds, drop by patreon.com slash Mike J. Langer. That's it for me this week. Hope everyone is safe, sane, and healthy out there. <laughs>